Hi guys, today we are talking about style. And these few lectures on style are probably the most important lectures in the class. They're all about what I want you to know overall of what we're learning. So let me show you slides of where we're looking at here. So when you put together the elements and the principles and composition, we arrive at style. Look, big style. So style is in the way in which elements and principles are employed. The result of technique and composition. So we've got Da Vinci drawings over on the left here. So style and movements are two separate things. And when you see the suffix istic, it's usually referring to technique. And when you see the subject ism, it is usually referring to a specific historical movement that would have a stylistic technique associated with it. So you'll get that in a few minutes. Movement names can be capitalized, they usually are. So when we say the word modern with a small m, it just means now, right? Contemporary, modern. If we see it with a big M, or an ism, it means the movement of modernism. And then finally, we see it with istic, modernistic. And that just means in the style of that movement. And so the big, big question about style is, is it naturalistic or is it abstract? So you can see over on the left, we've got something really naturalistic. On the right, we've got something really abstract. So those are the two broad categories. And we'll start with naturalistic art. This is sometimes called objective or figurative art and depicts the perceived appearance of things. It represents, so presents again, the objects we recognize from the everyday world or objects we can imagine happening in the everyday world. All naturalistic art is representational. It could be very lifelike, it could also be very loose. So you can see on the Wayne Tebow painting over on the side that this is naturalistic. It's not perfect, right? The lines aren't all perfect. It's representing real things. Again, all naturalistic art is representational. It represents the world real or imagined. So the physics of the real world are usually still there. I think I've got another slide about this in a few minutes, but gravity is usually still there, right? The way things are interacting is still there. All the physics of the real world are still there. If you've got someone floating upside down in a room, it's probably not the same kind of naturalism as we might see with idealism. We'll get to that in a few minutes. Again, all naturalistic art is representational, even if what's being depicted is fictional or mythical. And so under that broad category then of naturalistic art, we've got quite a few other types of naturalistic art. So we divided into naturalistic or abstraction, and now we're looking at just the side that's naturalistic art. The first one I wanna look at is realism and realistic. So realism was a movement primarily in the 1800s that showed common people in commonplace situations in a really straightforward naturalistic manner. Again, that doesn't mean it has to be perfect lines and photographic. It's just the people are being depicted in a really naturalistic manner. Um, anything not produced in that movement or contemporary examples of such um, that depict things in that same style are realistic and they refer to actual or lifelike depictions. So the key here though, is that realism was usually not dramatic. And in fact, they often look kind of calm. 
It's only after you see the work do you get mood out of it. And a lot of the work shows troubling issues or difficulties or strife. Realism does not have to look incredibly lifelike or pictorial. Make sure you are using the term realism and even realistic correctly. It's the most misused term in learning about art. It depicts life as it is. So here's an example from Courbet, um, the Stonebreakers. And so this is a very realistic scene and it's in the realism movement. Um, before work like this, you would not often see a painting of just some guys working, right? Like all of the Renaissance work and later we'll see Baroque and Rococo work. Um, was all about grand things. It was about kings and queens and noble people and religious subjects. But this was different because it was just about common people. And it's showing these common people doing work, right? So these, this was revolutionary because it wasn't about this big grand thing. It's just regular people working and about their working conditions. So it's only when we start to decipher what's going on here, do we get what's happening, right? So it's not flashy, but it's real. They're shown without fanfare, they're not images of royalty, they're not famous people or events, they're not fantastical scenes. the gleaners. So this is several women working in a field. So the painting still has beauty to it. It's just in a different way. And maybe at first we see this as, as a simple scene, but again, you start to get into what's going on here. Um, these people are working and, and by painting a picture of them, maybe it does and somehow glorify them, but it raises our, our consciousness uh, about what's going on here, consciousness. Little movement happening here. Calm, though with big social comment. And this leads us to, to documentary, right? So documentary um, photography, and you can see that this is even later on, 1936, but it still does the same thing. This is realistic, right? It's not in the movement of real, realism, but it's realistic. Um, it's straight documentary. There, there are some rumors about this that she was posed, but nonetheless, the situation she's in was real. Um, a lot of her work, Dorothy Lang, was about taking pictures of people in their real lives during hard times. Realistic, again, later on, not realism. Everyone isolated in the family. Kind of weird. But with a straw hat waiting to march in a pro war parade. Kind of reminds me of the futurists. Now, Lewis Hine is a super important photographer. Um, he mostly shot photos of children working in factories. And back in the day, um, this happened all the time. And basically, if it wasn't for Lewis Hine documenting this and bring it to the attention of the wider public, all of us would have been working in factories when we were eight years old. 
So this was super important work. I think these are boys getting ready to work in a mine. I mean, this is crazy. Look how powerful that image is. Look, not, not a lot of movement happening here. Her eyes are directed at her by the perspective lines and the focal point on her. Not all this action going on. It's just a portrait of her surrounded by machines. These guys. I really, really, really want you to watch this. So when you go back through the slides, click on this link and watch this. It's all about Lewis Hein. Later on, after all that stuff, something different happened with his work. It's less realism, less realistic. It's more idealization. So this is another type of naturalism, idealization. And we separate that from realism. So idealized work is naturalistic as well. It's been elevated above reality. People and things are perfected. People have perfect features. There's no flaws. The scene is just perfect. The lighting is just perfect. Sometimes a specific element is perfected to an ideal by the artist, like scale, or specific principle, like emphasis. And those are, those are principles that we looked at before. They've been so honed in on to make, to part of the way to make the scene just perfect. Get this, depictions of biblical or mythological figures are always idealizations. Look at this, how elevated above reality this is. Look how perfect this scene is. Super idealized. I doubt a workshop was this calm and harmonious. Titian, Venus of Urbino. I think we looked at this before. But this is street idealization. I mean, she's all perfected. The dog is perfected. The scene is perfected. Everything is perfected. Interesting. We've got a little bit of that realistic stuff happening in the background with, with the maids who are of a lower caste in society. Overall, this is very, very idealized. School of Athens, super idealized. All perfect. Here's a term, trompe l'oeil, and that's French for fool the eye. And it's a highly illusionistic style where things look so lifelike, they actually appear three-dimensional, even though they are two-dimensional objects. So there's, there's a lot of use of perspective here, right? Two and three-point perspective, but, but they're, they're taken way beyond that to such a level of perfection that we are fooled, in a sense, to think that these are actually there. So trompe l'oeil, you need to know that term. Idealization. Why would you pay to have your portrait painted if you didn't want a perfect representation of yourself? Idealization, we come back to this painting. Everything perfected, everything in its place, everything where it goes. 
the people, the objects, all the symbols we looked at before, everything just right. Here's an example of idealized. Go to Vogue. Um, it's all idealization. We see idealization all the time. Instagram influencers, just everything around us has been idealized. And that's kind of a big picture of the world that we see today. All of Hollywood, right? Big films, all idealized above and beyond real life. Renaissance works as a whole are thought of as idealized. And we can think of the Renaissance as a whole as idealism, as, as an age, as a movement. Okay. Within idealization, we also have other categories. We've got classical and we've got big C classical. So big C classical is ancient Greek or Roman artwork. So idealized sculptures depicting people and gods or goddesses and stories. Little C classical with the small C's work produced after Greek and Roman times that revisits these ideas. So Many government buildings in the US and around the world have columns and look like they're from Greek architecture. We would call that neoclassical. So they're new versions of classical ideas. So classical would be Greek sculptures, Roman sculptures. Little C classical would be new versions of those ideas. This is big C classical, Greek, idealized sculptures. 580 BC, Sanctuary of Apollo at Delphi, actually a Greek building, big C classical. Here's some, some terms. When you see 580 BC, that means before Christ. The new word for that is BCE, which means before common era. AD is Anno Domini in the year of our Lord. And the new term for that is CA or CE. That's a typo, common era. Big C classical. Big C classical. Little C classical. This was made in the Renaissance to protect an image of, of the perfected human form. So much like big C classical work depicted idealized human forms. Another way, in other words, this is a continuation of the idea, but it's not big C classical. Neoclassical. Small C classical. Now we would call this, this idealized and small C classical. We can take this one even further and we're gonna do that with the next lecture. So really pay attention to these lectures and go back through them read the slides as well. See you next time.